Welcome to the Whitetail Legacy Podcast. Tomorrow is opening day. This morning, then I have a great hunt. Deer didn't move like usual. Here we just got set up in the middle of this bedding thicket. Oh, saving this spot from the rut. It's a nice, I think it's a nice buck. It's a 170. That was money. I think he's down right over there. 10 yards. Woo! Whitetail Legacy Podcast. Bringing you back to the hunt and leaving a legacy. Baller rut. Welcome to the Whitetail Legacy Podcast. <laughs> yes! It is the rut. And we still have no bucks down. <laughs> I just choked because I just I don't even know if that was true or not because we're recording this early because homie has a baby right now. I do. I homie do. Homie has a brand new baby in his this house. This is my last night recording with one child. Yeah, that's that's major. So, uh, yeah, we st- we're recording we Friday night. Ha- we may have bucks down by now. I have no idea. It's Friday night. I'm having a baby Sunday morning at seven a.m. Most likely, not. Not gonna have him down. Most but like no. Most likely, gonna have another podcast partner. For we need to have the we need to have our kids on when they're like six. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about deer hunting? I don't really know. Uh, Dad never lets me go. Um, he always says I'm too loud. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> he brings snacks. Are, are we? Can we release the baby's name on this episode? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is you guys are getting to know really quick here. This is major. Um, so we named the baby. It's kind of conflicting, but it is Hoyt Matthew. I don't even know what to say right now. <laughs> so um, cool. Um I think he did that because we don't know if we want a Hoyt or a Matthew sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> that is just a joke, but it's hilarious. So why'd you name him that? Um, I mean, we want something different, but uh, I am a Hoyt guy. I I love their bows, and <clears throat> I just kind of bullshit with the wife. I was like, well, why don't we just name him Hoyt? And she's like, well, yeah, I like that. And then I was like, yeah, I'm down with that. And then we tried... We tried. Then you shot a Triax. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sure on the name. <laughs> it might be Matthew Hoyt. <laughs> um, and then there's just literally no middle name that we like that went with Hoyt. So Could've it is it. Hoyt Matthew. And Could've I was like, oh, William. shit. What are Could've we going to do with that? William after me. Hoyt, oh, jeez. Hoyt, Hoyt William. William. That's a mouthful. That sounds pretty good. Eight beers in, you ain't going to be able to say that. Only need to remember the first two letters. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Man. We're back with Steve Stoltz. This is a serious tactic b- yeah. podcast, and here we are doing the intro <laughs> like this. This is just normal White to Legacy podcast uh, style. So uh, we're going in deep on rut calling tactics on this episode. This is the number two episode with Steve, because when you get a guy like Steve on the line... You just gotta let the good, good go. You gotta let it flow. Yeah. Um, I think we cover a lot in this. A snort, the snort technique that you guys are about to hear. I really like that idea. Very cool idea. That's, um, that's when just... knowing not to call, or when to know to not keep calling. Mm-hmm. Uh, major good tip on that. So uh, it's just stuff that you, as a, a hunter, might have overthought. Yeah, so stuff that like you or don't not thought about. You don't realize until you've been hunting so long that you're like, why haven't I been doing this? But then a guy like Steve says it, and you're like, well, pff, I should have been doing that for years. And it's so it's like simple stuff that you just don't think about. Like why don't said. we just think about everything about deer hunting, and then we can just be the expert? Because yeah. it, I mean, how I think hard was that? I to be an expert, you have to have ten thousand hours in a craft, and I bet you Steve has that. Yeah. We are, oh, yeah. We're not even close combined. Oh, <laughs> no, no. So, got about six. Yeah, we got about six hours in stand this year, so <laughs> times ten. <laughs> uh, so here we go. Let's get into the partners. 
Well, starting with the title partner, the VIP, the OG, the veteran broadhead. Hit him with the, the shout out. Uh, the veteran broadhead shout out is brought to you by Bushlight and the veteran broadhead. Hit him. This week on the VIP Veteran Broadhead shout out. This sounds like it's pre recorded because your voice is just so. I know, doesn't it? Yeah, I was thinking, really. I was like, dude, all these guys are thinking yeah. I'm just at home yeah, or at work yeah, just yeah. knocking out 12 VIP yeah, shout outs no. every it's week. Just, just what we get like two days before we. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 20 minutes. Yeah, okay, go ahead. VIP Veteran Broadhead shout out is Brandon Kinney. Uh, he's a part of the U.S. National Guard, and he has been putting a veteran to work this year. Um, he shot a doe in the neck that I mentioned on way back, uh, this year. And then, um, he's also got it done on a buck and a turkey since then. So, yeah. uh, we can't thank Brandon enough. Uh, I, I know he's, uh, missing some time with his daughter on some weekend warrior business. So, uh, I'm sure that's affecting him and his, his, uh, personal life. So we can't thank you enough for doing what you do, man. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. We appreciate your time spent uh, to help this nation, no matter what you're doing. A uh, big thank you from, uh, I think we need to add uh, White Tail Legacy Podcast Crew, our family, and Matt and Cindy. Yeah, because absolutely. I think that's, and the VIP family. I think, yeah. I think we need to start saying that because this is coming from them also, mm-hmm. saluting troops. So big yeah. shout out for, thank you from Matt and Cindy from Texas also to Brandon. Because this is just another thing that Matt and Cindy, you know, obviously support. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a very good idea right there. All right. Uh, let's get into Ingram's outdoor obsession. Um, will you have a, bu- he, will you his have a buddy, buck there? His buddy. Oh, yeah, his buddy dropped two Ryan, bucks the same night. Yeah, Ryan is Both shot, went there. Both went there. I yeah. cannot wait to see the mounts that is going to come out of that. Yeah. I don't know. I think he might be doing euros on both, but on both. Oh, dude, yeah. the one in the evening, I would have shoulder yeah. mounted all day. Yeah, but great, great deer. I mean, yeah. But I think he likes that guy. Likes euros quite a bit. Hmm. I told him if I shoot a buck in Missouri, I'm going to do a backpack mount or some kind of like that. Yeah, just something different. Right. Something unique. Uh, I really. I seen. So I seen a coyote mount driftwood with some like crp grass mm-hmm. and it was like a quarter body so it was like a shoulder mount coyote oh did it have the legs out of the wall had the legs okay with like a driftwood piece and like a fence post and then some crp grass like coming out of the wall i thought that would look real cool on that coyote that i got and it would take up less room like right underneath homeboy over there like a coyote coming out so i was gonna show that to him and say hey is this something that you think you could do so yeah, might be an idea. I mean, maybe it'd just be on the coward I shoot this year. Yeah, <laughs> how about that? With a bobcat. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right, uh, scent lock. What do we want to talk about? Scent lock. There's just so much. They got so much good stuff. We don't. We're never prepared on the intros. How much stuff do you have in your bag right now, dude? <clears throat> my bag. Uh, it probably weighs as much as Homie does because he lost all that weight. Yes. So. uh and I'll tell you what, dude, I have thrown that thing around. Like, I am not gentle on that thing. That thing is tough. And the zippers, dude, that's like, that's some solid zippers. The zippers is yeah. key. Um, I'll tell you one thing. The the damn plug-in. So yeah. I have 120 in my truck that I just run it off of instead oh, nice. of using a cigarette lighter. Got Every time I get new it. Dodge truck. <laughs> I, I can't afford that. So that's track inspector money. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I get out of the truck, I get to the piece, I I forget to unplug it. Just rip it right and out. And I just rip the bitch right out. So lately, I've been better because it's it's in my routine now. I'm like, I'll get back there, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to unplug it. So yeah. go up there, unplug it. But I've got a ton of gear in that. Uh, I've got shirts. I've got clothes, sweaters in there that I don't even wear. But uh, yeah, I, I got late wear. season stuff. So the other night I put on, th- or uh, last night when I went out, what was it like forty two or something? Yeah, I wore three layers, dude. I was so warm. I wore two sit lock suits and a th- base <laughs> layer because <laughs> I happened to have two sit lock suits. So I was just like, I, I I don't have much of a walk. I'm just gonna put them both on. So warm, Ooh. Like, it was great. But I forgot a beanie. 
I was like, oh, oh. God, the wind's blowing. That was the only thing. You ever get your hat? What? Or did you? No, or did you not? I didn't. Did you? You forgot to order it. Yeah, I got the it. thin set lock, but I don't have the heavy one. Right on. Which I need to do. We just need to make some beanies. Yeah. That'd be sick. We need to get on a bunch of stuff. Yeah. There's a lot going on right now. A lot going on. <laughs> Um, so this will be after our sitlock bag giveaway, right? Oh yeah, way, way. So well, not well, way. Yeah, it'd be no. about a week. Okay, yeah. So uh, whoever won that, congrats! You're gonna utilize that thing a ton. Um, I'm thinking about we're well, we did the live video before you went to Missouri after we got a hunting Friday yeah. night. Big shout out to Sitlock for letting us do that. That's yeah, huge. thank you. Uh, thanks to Nick for helping us out there. If you guys heard in episode 50 that we had Nick on, um, we did, but we didn't. Yeah, we got some. We didn't want we. I was listening to that myself, and I was like, "Eh, some people are gonna think that they miss an episode." Yeah, but we just yeah. want to clear that up right there. You did not miss an episode. You did not miss episode. We have that on the back burner, with maybe release date in the future. Right. That's all I can say right now. Um, it's a super solid episode. Oh God, it's man. so good. I w- Nick is just such a genius <sighs> on the sync control. It's insane. So. All right, here we go. Let's get in. Let's get in. Steve Stoltz, uh, rut calling tactics plus whatever we left out on the last episode. <laughs> uh, it's. I hope. I hope he ends it. Homie ends it like mid sentence, so you yeah. have to come back to the next one. <laughs> like you have to listen to that one before you listen to this one to catch up. On I'll, I'll probably. Have. I'll probably be like planning it to just end it perfectly, and then I'll just get hit with like a shitty diaper, and then it'll be off in mid sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right. I uh, hope you guys enjoys uh, enjoys enjoys. <laughs> <laughs> There's Cody again. I can't talk. Here we go. Sending it. So, well, we we kind of got off topic about the app, but I want to get into whitetail calling. Okay, so it's the rut here. It's say it's November second, and I'm Steve Stoltz, and I'm going to the woods. What it? What kind of calling am I going to be doing? Well. First off, uh, you you want to get a Woodhaven Power Flex grunt. <laughs> That's uh, that that is the best grunt call I think uh, out there right now. But and I don't have one with me. I left all my. I'm at work at the firehouse here in St. Louis, and I left all my deer calls in my uh, in my backpack up at my Iowa house. <laughs> so I apologize for that. But um, so let's look at the time of the year. Right now, it's it's the, starting to become the roaming phase of the rut where they're really anxious. The does aren't quite in the estrus yet. Um, and so you want to use a call um, such as the trailing grunt, which is one of the most used, most often used grunt you'll hear. And that's the grunt where they're just about grunting on. It's like almost like they grunt every step. You know, that whoa, 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 whoa. And um, it, it, it's, 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 it, it's emitted when the buck is on the trail of a hot doe. Uh, I also hear it, uh, given when a buck is actually just sent trailing a doe. Remember this, these does are getting ready to come in and the closer they, they get ready to come in, the more anxious and amped up these bucks uh, are getting. They're ready to breed as soon as they lose the velvet off their antlers. They're ready to breed. A buck is. So they've been amped up for a long time. And now you're at the right now, at November 2nd, in these last few days, you're at the very, very cusp of right before the does come into estrus. I mean, it's, it's, it's right there. And they can't take it anymore. And the reason why they can't take it anymore is because the does are starting to smell right. They know that smell when they're starting to smell right. Okay. And that's why so much in October so many good deer are shot on food plots especially in the evening on these big bucks will come in bumping around and checking on the status of the does they're coming in to smell them they want to smell what their status is okay, make no mistake about it their nose is their number one defense and their number one factor for determining what they're doing at any time anywhere and so you want to use a grunt that is really commonly heard during that time that's the trailing grunt and again i hear it when they are actually trailing a doe following a doe 
or I also hear it a lot when they're by themselves just scent trailing a doe. And it is an awesome call to give to them. If they hear another buck give the tending grunt, uh, typically they'll, they'll come over within bow range if you're bow hunting uh, and give you a shot, providing you got the wind to your advantage. Now let's talk real quick about setting yourself up for success calling. There's two things you have to remember if you're going to call to a whitetail. One, they like to circle downwind of the source. Two, they like to see a deer when they hear a sound. So they want to place a deer body, whether it be buck or doe, to the source of the sound. Um, when a mature buck, and this particularly when on a big mature buck, I'm talking four and a half, five and a half, six and a half year old buck, when they look and see clearly there is no deer where they hear the sound, it will change their mood. And what is the biggest factor in successfully calling in a big whitetail is catching them in the right mood. What's the biggest factor of calling in a, tur a turkey gobbler in the spring? Catch them in the right mood. And it's as simple as that. You don't have to be a world champion caller. You don't have to be a, a, a top-notch pro hunter to call a buck in, but you got to catch them in the right mood. And so you throw that buck grunt out at them and you're in a spot where you have the wind to your advantage. They can't get downwind of you, A. And B, they can't really see that because you're in timber, say, and then maybe they can't see you all the way over to you. They're going to come over and check you out. What is the, when you see, when you see a buck and you, and you try to grunt at him, yeah. what's the closest you're going to let him get before you stop calling? Or once you see him coming in, are you just done calling at that point? Well, now you just brought up the, the probably I stopped too short in saying at some point you got to just like turkey hunting, you got to stop and let them hunt you. So my answer to that is once you see them commit towards your direction, you need to stop calling because the more calling you do where they can clearly see where you're at or you're even up in a tree, then the less chance you got of that working and bringing them in close. I've, I've heard that tending grunt. That's like the grunt that you hear when you're sitting there and you ain't seen anything for a while. And then all of a sudden you hear that bark, bark, bark. And you're like, oh, 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 oh. And then it's a forget horn. My, normally in my case, you know what I mean? But but that's that's the grunt that I hear the most often, I think. One thing that I've seen with that, Steve, is, you know, just me being, uh, you know, this is way back when I started shotgun hunting. Um, I would hear that tending grunt, but I just thought it was that deer um, you know, he was really chasing a doe, hot and heavy, and I just thought like it was him trying to grunt, but it was the force of his body on the ground, you know, making that air go through his esophagus, making him grunt, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, realize this, that bucks, um, you know, they use the tending grunt uh, most often when they have an estrus doe pinned down. Um, you know, it's a sign of frustration. It's a sign of dominance. Um, and it's that low guttural sound. It's drawn out and, um, you know, starts out low, you know, low and gets higher and tapers off, and you know. And then it's also great to use after you do rattling sequences. Um, you know, and, and, and here's the take home point. When a big mature buck hears another buck do this grunt, they're going to they're going to think there is a doe and estrus close. And so they're going to want to come check it out. And there's no no question that when done at the right time and catch them in the right mood, grunt calls and, and deer calling can be so effective. But by that same token, I, 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 I want to exercise the word of caution in, in that uh, the, uh, calling a buck is like burning a ship and they remember. And so when they get into a certain point and don't see a deer and start getting squirrely and leave or win you, uh, the chances of actually calling to that deer uh, the rest of that year anyway is going to be pretty slim. Um, so uh, use calls to their to the best of their, your ability as far as uh, when you need to use them. If all else is failing, get that call out. Don't, don't be scared to call at them. Make sure your wind is right first. Check it with that smoke detector or some kind of wind checker and make sure that they're not going to, when you call to them, they're not going to be downwind of you because that's when you don't get the call out. You can have a buck going through your wind, your wind stream and, and, and not winding you because, A, he's not paying too much attention 
other than to deer smells. You're not expecting to smell any human smell. B, you're scented, scent free. Your clothes are aired out. You're doing all your scent free tactics. So that's working. But once you call to them, now you put them on alert. Now you put them start to start to smell for other things than just deer and they could pick you up. So, uh, it, it, so is, is, is effective as calls can be, they can be super non-effective if that deer is going to get, definitely get downwind of you or heading down into your downwind stream. So the first thing I do whenever I see a buck that I think is remotely close to being a shooter is I check my wind. I check and see, I meet, it's the first thing I do is I'm squeezing that little bottle, that smoke detector. I want to see where my wind is going before I make that decision to actually grunt, grunt or call or rattle in them. So when you're talking calling this time of year, are you talking blind calling or calling when you see a, a buck? <clears throat> As I get older and wiser, I do less and less blind calling. And the reason why is yes, it is effective, and I have rattled in some nice bucks. Very seldom have I ever, ever blind rattled in a world-class buck. And when the few times that I have blind rattled a world-class buck in, they have got to a certain point, and that's usually about 100 yards away in the open timber, and realize there's not enough another buck there, and they tense up, and they get extremely nervous and typically end up leaving and typically walking out of my life. So... And I mean that. And so um, uh, I'll tell you a little story about blind blind rattling that kind of fixed me a few years ago. And it involves the genius Mark Dury himself. I had a cameraman with me filming for Buckman TV, which is a television show, by the way, that I do. Uh, we've aired two seasons. We're going to air a third season uh, and we're going to do it on digital media. Not yet sure what venue, but it's coming. Uh, so I'm filming for Buckman TV, which is my whitetail show, and um, got a cameraman with me, and I do a rattling sequence, a blind rattling sequence, and I'm going to say the day was probably, it was a morning of, say, November the 10th or 12th, and uh, may have been November 8th, somewhere in that magical four or five day period, and beautiful, crisp, clear morning, had the right wind. And I do my rattling sequence, hang up the horns. I follow up with a with a with a, a tending grunt, put the grunt call away, look up, and here is a world class giant coming right for the tree. And about oh 75, 80 yards, he stops and stares right to the base of my tree. And it's wide open timber between him and I. And I'm going to say his score, I'm going to estimate, can we just estimate uh, 185 to 190 or, or better? And so, and it's all on film, so film don't lie. Right. <laughs> okay. So the deer eventually does not commit all the way, gets very scared, spooky, ends up leaving, and literally walks out of my life. Um, so I sent that little video clip. I, I, video, I took my phone that night and videoed it off the television screen. Because we watched the footage, we were in awe of the size of this deer. And I, by the way, had never seen him before. He was a stranger, um, which I'm going to get to how I figured out later uh, what, what he was doing. Um, so I called the genius himself, Mark Dury, because I'm allowed to do that. I have his cell phone number on my phone. That's awesome. And, uh, <laughs> That's a nice perk. <laughs> <laughs> so I called Mark, and I said, I'm going to send you a video clip and just let me know what this deer scores. Okay. So hung up the phone. I sent them the video clip. Do you know what the first thing he texted me back? So all I sent him was that buck looking, looking, turning his head, looking, and then turn around and sneaking off. Do you know what the first thing Mark texted me? Did you kill this him? Is without, <laughs> this is without telling him I rattled, grunted, did anything. The first message from Mark after I sent that video and he viewed it was, Quit blind rattling on your farm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now you know. Now I just told you the exact reason why I, as I get older, I'm getting smarter. And I'm telling you, blind rattling and blind calling is 
is not near as effective. The, the, the best way to have blind rattling and blind calling not, uh, uh, let's just say, uh, increase your chances is if you have the perfect situation. And I tell you how you can fix that. You can actually hang stands to rattle and grunt out of, not for structure, not for sign, not for even travel corridors, just literally, uh, and I guess more based on structure, but uh, for wind direction, say blowing from a hollow that they travel in, bucks travel in, out to a, a, a destination feed field where they can't get downwind of you unless they come out of that hollow. If the wind's blowing from the hollow or the ravine to you and out to the field, and then have a decoy up. Get take the take the take the extra step and put a full body decoy up, maybe with a a, a buck decoy with one antler gone or both antlers doesn't make any difference and put that decoy up you know bow range of your stand in the field and then that's the situation that blind rattling works the best because if you do get a buck's attention a he can't get downwind of you unless he trots out in the middle of the field he's not going to do that b he's going to probably try and circle downwind by going past your stand out to the field so you'll get a shot at him and c he'll have a visual of that buck decoy, which will keep him calm. Other than that, I almost don't blind rattle and call anymore, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Cody and I, you know, we've heard Mark on a couple podcasts, and he says as he gets older and uh, figures it out more and more, he does not rattle at all, even if he um, sees a deer. So he says he just is is not into it anymore, and uh, it's just experiences, just like you said, you know, over the years that have taught him that, you know, not much luck. You got to have the perfect scenario in order to rattle in um, what most of us would call a shooter. Yes, the the kind of shooter that we're looking for, anyway. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can fool those two and a half year olds, and sometimes the three and a halfs. You're not going to do it with that six and a half, seven and a half year old. You're not going to do it, Mister Freeze. Yeah, see, that's that's the thing I asked on a couple of podcasts ago, and the guy opted me against it because Mr. Freeze had a bunch of broken tines off last year mm -hmm. and uh, broken brows, broken kickers, uh, G5 broke off. Yep. And, uh, yeah, he, I was like, you know, you know, he was fighting at that point. You would assume that he would got in a tussle to break that much stuff off. I, I don't know if they rubbing on trees, if they would break that much stuff off, you know what I mean? But, uh, well, I, I opted on that and he said not to rattle. So Yeah, I, I don't I don't blame him. And I'm not saying that I don't carry my rattle antlers and my rattle bag with me. Woodhaven, by the way, makes a great uh, power flex rattle bag uh that I keep with me. That's something I need to look into because I just dropped my antlers out of my stand the other night and I was like, Oh, that's so loud when it hit the ground. <laughs> and there's yeah. like it's so awkward to put a set of antlers in the stand with you. Like you can hang them on a hook, but then I mean, I don't know. I've, just... I've I've always had a rattle bag, and yeah. I just got a set of antlers ready today. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, there, there's advantages, you know. The, uh, there's 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 plus and minuses to both. Uh, the real antlers are exactly what they are. They sound more real, but um, they are more cumbersome and dangerous uh, to carry around and loud and noisy. Um, and uh, the rattle bag is just so much more inconvenient. So I find myself when I do any traveling or flying on on whitetail hunts, I'll just pack the rattle bag, um, uh, and 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 again I revert back to that scenario I just said. I found to where I don't blind rattle, or call uh, almost none unless the situation is perfectly set up right. I got a decoy out. Um, unlike Mark, I will still rattle at a big upper end mature buck on one on one occasion, and that's when I put a visual on him. And I know he's leaving and not going to come anywhere near where I'm at. I will tickle the horns at him as a last resort. Yeah, that's and a I good idea. It, you know, I, I, I do it more, more not to run, make them run into my position then. But I think they store that in their memory back. And within an hour or two, or maybe later on that day, they'll sneak back in to see if they can pick up the estrus dough that they heard the two bucks fighting over. Oh, yeah. I never thought about that. So they're not going to come there right there. But they're like, I knew that there was something over there a couple hours ago. Mm -hmm. So I, this spot that I, I went to, there's nothing there. So they're circling back. 
That's a good exactly. tip. That's an awesome. I've tip. actually, I've, I've, I've often, I've seen it actually happen. L- literally, actually happen. Um, sometimes even within an hour, within an a, an hour of that of the horn tickling, um, you know, I, I've I've seen I've seen them where they've snuck back in and from almost sometimes a completely different direction. Which you know, go figure. They're trying to circle downwind and get wind of you. So. Um, it, the, the times that that's happened to me, they, 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 they literally like just almost shock me. All of a sudden I see, see a good buck and they're almost bone range of the tree already. Just kind of just slipping in, looking and, and, you know, and that's because I tickled the horns an hour earlier or whatever, you know? So, um, okay. Let's go into, let's say it's, uh, it's peak, you know, it's that eighth through the 15th of November. You feel like a lot of does are coming in. Um, you're still not doing any blind riding, but say you got a buck out there. Are you going to be more aggressive at this point? Are you going to maybe snort wheeze or? Oh, I'll definitely try and snort wheeze at them. If I think it, it, it's conditions are right. And I got the wind to my advantage, but bear in mind, I, I, I think, um, what we need to really, uh, and this goes along with what Mark Dury was telling you. Um, you just got to really, really, really treat it, uh, your calling to a big mature buck with kit gloves, you know, because they're, they're just not no dummy. They didn't get that big, uh, being stupid. So, uh, you kind of just give them just exactly what might be needed and then cut it off and let them come hunt you. And if they don't come hunt you, you may want to kind of just give it up and, and, and hunt them another day, you know, type thing. Um, you just can't be too aggressive with 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 these big mature bucks because they'll you know they will you know they'll know the jig is up you know they they'll pick up on the fact there's not another deer there uh pretty pretty darn quick yeah i've i made that mistake i was hunting uh it would have been 2015 and uh there was an eight pointer that was running around that the neighbors had got on trail camera. That was absolute giant of an eight, just an insane. Eight. <laughs> Dude, that just, thing was huge. Like if I tell, if I tell what it scored the next year when they shot it, people wouldn't even believe me. But anyways, I had him come in on a set and I grunted at him and just like all big mature deer, he hung up about that 60, 70 yard range. And, uh, being, you know, it was just three years ago, but the amount of knowledge that I've attained in three years has been so vast that I would never do what I did. Then I snort wheezed at him. He already knew my exact location and I snort wheezed at that buck and he literally backed up without ever taking, walked backwards without ever taking his eyes off of that location, turned and took three or four hops and then would blow and stop and blow and then take three or four hops and stop and blow and take three or four hops. And it was the craziest thing I've ever seen, but he ended up getting shoot, shot the next year and he was a 184 inch eight pointer. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. They don't get, that's the, I mean, he had the biggest brows I've ever seen on any deer. Homie's seen the picture. I, I was going to say, I've just, seen the picture. It was it's just ridiculous. Insane. And he was probably in the one sixties when I had the opportunity at him at 60 yards. And I showed homie, we hunted that stand. I'm like, he was right there. Yeah. That's where he was at. And I snort wheezed at him. Ton, a ton of cover in between us. A lot of uh, wire, uh, briar bushes and stuff, uh, down trees where he couldn't really see. But still, him not seeing that movement like you're talking about, and then me pushing the envelope saying, okay, I got to make this happen, and doing that snort wheeze just completely, you wouldn't think it would intimidate a deer that big but he was just like okay i do not like this at all i'm moving out and now i have not snort wheezed at a deer since <laughs> so yeah and, and 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 i still wouldn't be scared to snort wheeze at one at the right conditions i've actually seen them run to a snort wheeze i've seen them uh i've heard deer snort um i've, I've actually just snorted and, and and caught their attention and stopped them um just because they hear a snort doesn't mean a deer is spooked um i've seen them run directly towards a snort um, uh, again, uh, once they get to a point where they think they should see a deer and they don't, that's when their mood and demeanor will change. Yeah. And that deer had me, he didn't have me pegged in the stand, but he had that area pegged, but he was, it was weird cause he was still behind a ton of cover, even at 70 yards. And he was doing that kind of head bob thing where he was kind of trying to figure out if there's anything over there. And then I snort wheezed at him 
<laughs> like like a you know a inexperienced yeah. deer hunter. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that snark wheeze would have been way better served if you if he started walking off where his head was turned and not looking. Yeah, that would have been then, way better. That's a then snark great wheeze, tip. At least at least you'd have spun him back around and maybe yeah maybe get his curiosity a little bit more. Just pause for a second, let him say, okay, okay. I'm not sure if there's anything there. He turned around, walking away. Then I hit him with the snort wheeze. I was like, okay, there might be something there. That's that's awesome, my tip. I would never even thought of that. That right. scenario so, could have broke down a lot different. And, and so you just disclosed, together we just disclosed a great tip for, for reading the demeanor of a whitetail when you're wanting to call to him. Don't call to the darn deer when he's staring right at you looking for another deer because they will clearly see there's not another deer given that sound yeah and they will not tolerate it they will not tolerate it so there you go do you feel like the the snort wheezes that come on these grunt tubes um sound similar to the the um the written you know just a regular deer snort wheezing because i've seen some you know trail cam videos i'm not sure how good the audio is but it seems like a natural deer's snort wheeze is a lot higher pitched than it is when somebody does it on a grunt tube. Well, the 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 power flex snort wheeze that we make with Woodhaven is just almost exact. Again, I don't have with it, have it with me, and I apologize. But um, check it out. Go to www.woodhavencustomcalls.com. Check out their power flex line of calls, and their snort wheeze call is as good as anybody's got out there because there's an extender tube. And you can change that sound to higher pitch and lower pitch uh, snort and snort wheeze. So it's one of the only, it's the only snort call out there, snort wheeze or snort call out there that you can actually make a variable sound with it. Um, to answer that question, I was, I was involved with the, de the designing of the very first snort wheeze call ever. Uh, I was in on the design of that. I helped with, the, uh, the the intel as far as figuring out that, hey, we need to come up with a snort wheeze call. These bucks are doing it, and we're hearing them doing it. And if we come out with a call that makes that sound, uh, it would be a big help to, you know, to hunters. So I was, I was actually in on the design and the manufacturing of the very first snort wheeze call ever hit the market in the early 90s. Um, I, I personally think that's that's been the best sounding snort wheeze call out there, um, and it's very simple. It's a it's a tube with a with a with a um, with a size down orifice right past the lip area uh, to channel the air. Then it goes out out the end of the tube, um, and it is high pitched. It is very realistic sounding. Okay. Um, so, but I can't really so much criticize other people's snort wheeze calls other than i know the woodhaven one that i'm using now is is very accurate as well it, it, it gives the you can make it do the higher pitch snort yeah it's just uh something that i've noticed i've never had a grunt tube with a snort um on it so it's something that i've never done but it's just something that i've seen and picked up on watching videos um uh, watching trail cam videos that have been posted on social media and I just feel like that the ones that that I've heard on a call sound a lot different than you know just the natural sound of a snort wheeze from what the deer is actually putting out. So, right. So right. you you're talking about a snort. So is there something different between a snort and a snort wheeze? Yes. So a snort, uh, you know, is when the deer just uh, snorts, uh, either snorts. Uh, I call it an inquisitive snort um, or when they snort uh, and they're spooked. So without a, uh, you know, a call with me, uh, the patterns would be uh, inquisitive, inquisitive snort means they see another deer or a coyote or uh, something moves that you're not sure of. And it would be. <sighs> real quick short first snort so when they get alarmed and they run you'll hear they'll, they'll they'll bound off and snort that's an alarm snort yeah um the snort wheeze would be more of a subtle 
like that. So there is a big difference. I don't think you need to call Steve. No, Sounds yeah. pretty good to me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you know, the funny part about it is you wouldn't want to have video of me doing that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, luckily. I, I'd look like an idiot. Yeah, that's that's what we tell people. We got a face for radio, so that's why we don't do live podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So. Anyway, yeah. So that there's your there's your call patterns on your snorts and and snort wheeze. So, so oh, go ahead. Oh no, it just is the when they snort, not the snort wheeze, just a regular snort. Is that always an alert signal? No, and, and and I'll go back to what I just mentioned. Uh, so when they snort, they're just trying to get wind of something, but does not mean that they have seen or ca- have cause for danger. Um, so a lot of people are just freak out when they hear a deer snort. They think it's all done. And that's just absolutely not true. As a matter of fact, most of the time when I use my snort call, the power flex uh, snort call, snort wheeze call from, from Woodhaven, for instance, I have it handy because if a deer snorts and I think he's done, he or she has done it at me. Say, I, I'll give you an example. Say I'm setting up in the pitch dark and I'm in security cover and I know good and well, there's deer around me, but I'm setting up anyway. You know, I mean, you got to get set up and all of a sudden <laughs> deer snorts right there by me. You know what I do? I get my snort call out and snort back at that deer. And nine times out of 10, they'll calm back down. Even if they bound off a little bit, all they really think they're running from is a a deer sound that they they couldn't quite place. So it just doesn't spook them that bad. And most of the time, it'll calm them back down and they'll end up walking right by by my tree after snorting at me. So Wow, that's another great tip. I never even thought of that because that's happened to me like, you're like, you come to a field and you're getting set up and then something comes to the field early and you look around and you're like, oh man, you know, and then it snorts. If you would have just snorted again, because I feel like when a deer snorts, my hunt's over, it's you know a, what I mean? Yeah. You're, that's, I think no, that's what I mean, a lot of hunters feel like. That absolutely cannot be more not true. Uh, probably a, a urban legend is when you hear a snort, your hunt's over. It's just not true. Because la- or was it last year when I was on public and that doe snorted at me and then that buck came right back out like thirty minutes oh, later. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got right. video of doe snorting and it was it was because like a rain came in real hard and I think they heard that rain hitting the standing crops and it made them snort because it definitely wasn't my wind or anything. And then a buck came out thirty minutes later like nothing ever happened. A mature buck. Yep. yep. So those that are listening. Stop thinking snorting is ruining your your, your hunt because it, it it's not. Uh, now I'm not going to lie to you. If you're hunting a particular buck, say early season, um, in particular, uh, this isn't quite as prevalent in late season um, when it's deep, deep, deep cold because their power or their urge to eat overpowers a lot of their other senses. Um, but early season, especially your say scenario you're hunting mr freeze on that food plot and it's october 10th you've had a cold front come in and now you know there's a good chance he's going to show up before dark to that food plot to check on the doe situation and maybe get a little green before he heads out to to the destination feed field and it's you know you're it's go time it's 15 minutes before 10 minutes before he probably will show up and the does get wind of you and start snorting and stomping and run. And the chances are you might not see that target buck you're waiting for. But other than that, uh, I'm, I'm just using an isolated incident there that uh, that snorting could kind of ruin your hunt, no question. But, but for the most part, if you just keep a snort wheeze call with you, a good snort, a good call that's, you know, again, I'll, Woodhaven Custom Calls makes them. Keep that thing with you. It's small. Wrap it around your neck. Put it in your pocket, whatever. And if you're getting set up, if you're in a stand, if it's 8 o'clock in the morning and a deer starts snorting, you can't see, snort back at it. Because nine times out of ten, you'll you'll have a better chance of calming that deer, deer back down by snorting at it than actually alarming it. What have you got to lose? 
Yeah, at yeah. that point, you have I mean, nothing. It, if you think your hunt's over, then, I mean, you might as well, if, you know, try it. What have you got to lose? And many times, many, many, this is why I know it works. Many, many times I'm coming back down, including does. Big mama does are the toughest. They're tougher to, to, to get past than a, than a big mature buck as far as nose. And a big mama does starts picking up on you or, 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 or sees something or you move, didn't know she was there, and you, uh, and she spooked, starts snorting. Uh, by golly, by all means, get that snort call, start snorting back at them. And I have many times calmed them back down where they've fed right on by the tree and brought a big buck with them. Now, should you just try to mimic uh, the exact snort that they did? Uh, yep. Okay. Yep. Snort right back at them. Give it to them. Just like, it's just like trying to out call a hen, turkey call. Give it right back to her. That's a great tip. I've never heard that tip, no, but I can yeah. see it working perfectly. Oh, yeah. To There you go. First heard it on... Whitetail Legacy. Yeah, Whitetail Legacy <laughs> from Steve Stoltz. So. Okay, so let's get in. So now it's it's late rut. It's like the 26th, 27th. You know, there might be some second does coming in. Uh, are you still going to be doing the same kind of calling tactics that you were going to be doing like now, like in the pre-run? Are you still going to be doing that tending grunt, maybe a snort wheeze if they feel it, or is it too late to risk that kind of calling? I don't think it's ever too late to uh, to grunt, but I'm going to I'm gonna probably later uh, concentrate a little bit more on um, maybe even doe bleeding um, because – the, the does bleat all the time, to be honest with you. And if he's with a doe and you can, you can bleat and bleat her into you with her and work on her motherly instinct, that'll work. Or if he's by himself and he hears a little light bleat, he's liable to come check it out. Um, but I don't think it's ever too early or too late to grunt at a deer. I really don't. Um, now it may not be as effective, but, um, and I, I would definitely start out very low until you get their attention. Again, only put out enough sounds to get them kind of going or your attention or looking your way. And then you want to stop. You want eventually to let them hunt you. And if they don't, if you haven't got them in the right mood where they make that commitment to head your direction, then you're probably better off to just then stick the calls in your pocket and let, uh, let it take its course. So either he's going to come in or he's not, you know. Um, but you certainly... Do not want him to get spooky because you call at him, as we we, we covered earlier in this segment. Um, you call at him and he don't see another deer. For sure. So something that you mentioned there that I wanted to cover. I have never really yeah. doe bleeded a lot. Have you doe bleeded? I, a lot? I I've done some doe bleeding. Um, I've done it in conjunction with um, using scent, uh, yeah. doe estrus scent. And I think it's been more of the scent drawing in the bucks. Uh, I had a really nice encounter with a half rack ten. For some reason, his one side was gone. Yeah. Um, it was one of them spots where I was down the hillside and he was up the hillside, so we we're kind of at eye level. Uh, never was able to get drawn on him. Um, I've I've had a lot of encounters using scent, and I've used it with doe bleeding, but I've never actually heard a real live doe bleat. I've never heard a doe bleat either. Maybe it's just a difference. Uh, it's, it sounds different to my yeah. ear than I think it does, and I've missed it. Yeah. So in a scenario where yes. where a buck is, would you would you blind doe bleat, or would you only doe bleat if a buck was there? Most of my doe I, bleating is blind, by the way. Yeah. I would only doe bleat um, for two reasons. One is to bring a doe to me that, that maybe either has a good buck with her and nothing else is working or if I'm doe hunting uh, early season and I'm not getting a shot and I might try bleating at her and see if she'll come close enough for a shot. Uh, the second scenario is the most common scenario I'll doe bleed. And that is this. If I, if I can catch, and this is the perfect time of year for a doe bleed right now. I know it sounds crazy, but the roaming chasing phase of the rut where they start chasing. Okay. And that is a big mature buck chasing a doe. And you won't see that that often. Those big upper end bucks don't have to chase much. Usually when you see in the chasing phase, you see those mid range bucks. You see those two and a half year olds, those 18 month old. And you see those sometimes three and a half chasing, but very seldom ever older than that. You see outright chasing. And that's because a big older mature buck 
you know, they're older, they're fatter, they're wiser, and they know they don't have to chase. They know if they just bide their time and wait for the right time, they can just walk up and breed them. And so, uh, but if you're interested, if you see and witness a chase and you want to shoot that buck, because you know, so I'm not saying what kind of buck you want to shoot, but if you want to get a shot at that buck, <clears throat> I would suggest to get his attention by either rattling or, 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 or snorting, get him to stop. If I see that buck loses the doe, in other words, loses sight or um, track of that doe he's been chasing, that's when you throw the doe bleed out. And I will promise you nine times out of 10, he'll make a beeline for you because he'll think that's the same doe that he had just been chasing and he'll come right to your position. And I actually <clears throat> killed a nice Kansas whitetail on film, probably a mid 150s, big four and a half, five and a half year old buck doing that same thing. Nice. I've never doe bleeded to a doe early season, but that I'm going to try that now to get him to come closer. That That's a good idea. Steve's just sitting back. We're up here game planning, you know, how we've done things. And yeah. He's just like, these young kids have yeah. no idea what <laughs> they're like, doing. He's like, I've killed more deer than I could dream of. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I, I, I couldn't get this buck's attention. And actually, this buck that I killed in Kansas on film, he uh, and he was a wide 150 class 10 point. I, and I never did score him, so I don't know what he is. He might be 135. I don't know, but he looked like 150 to me. But the um, point is, he was an older buck, a mature buck. But a different buck was actually chasing a doe. So I actually had decided to shoot the buck that was chasing a doe, and he actually was a hair smaller. And I was trying to get his attention, trying to get his attention, and couldn't. And, 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 they ran by, and then about probably two minutes later, here comes this 150 class 10 point that I end up shooting, and he's by himself, but he's kind of keeping track of this of this chase, but he can't see where that doe's at. And boy, I just dope bleeded at him a couple times, and he turned and came right to the tree, and I double lumped him. Nice. He's probably like, yeah, I'm going to let that young buck wear that doe out, and then I'm going to come in and seal the deal. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he, was, he was walking over to mount her. <laughs> yeah, he was like, yeah, I'm going to let him run around for a while, that doe wear out. I'll just go over there and sweet talk her and flash yep. my rack, and it'd be over. <laughs> so, well, he's on the wall. <laughs> heck, yeah. Can't beat that. Uh-uh. So. That's one thing I think is so cool for you is you've got to experience the rut in multiple different states where mm -hmm. we've never really did that. But this, this is just another question I had. If you had to choose a three-day uh, Midwest time that you would want to be in the stand, you would never miss, what would be those three days? Oh, boy, that's a good question. Um, I'd say November Oh, <laughs> you, you, you got it narrowed down pretty slick there, buddy. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, yeah. I just I just feel like there's all like on my piece in my area, the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. It's just like a light switch where you're not seeing a lot. Bucks are still nocturnal. And then the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth hits and it's boom. They just switch. Well, I, and the I, morning so movement just, is insane. You just answered my question. Only I was going to say. If I had to choose just three days, and I said you can only hunt three days, I, I, on my farm in southern Iowa, I'd do November 10th, 11th, and 12th. 10th, 11th, and 12th. Yep. So that's pretty so, close, yeah. Same time frame, yeah. Yeah, I feel, like, I feel like I don't really see much this time frame, and then the I see some chasing some small bucks, and then when the 7th, 8th, ninth sits, I have one of those days where you just see like eight bucks. And like three shooters, and you're like, man, this is insane. <laughs> but if you would have missed those three or four days, you would have never seen that movement. It's just well, and I'm, I'm glad you just brought that up. I think, uh, you know, we, we we work all year and put food plots in and put trail cameras out, scout and hang stands and trim and you know, <laughs> big whitetails are a lot of work. It's not for the lazy guy um, or the lazy hunter, I should say. Um, it's, and that's just the way it is. I mean, it's it's a year-round job. Um, and the 
if you're talking about terms of the rut and the actual good days of the rut, man, you're just getting it down to where um, I'd say if I had to tell you the number of good days every rut, um, I'd say it'd be less, it'd be around five. Yeah, that's what I see. I see on my piece. And they can be sporadic. So say November 7th and 8th is great. November 11th is great. And November 14th is great. And all the other days are pretty slow. So my point is, it's really kind of a lot quicker and shorter window than people uh, people think. Yeah, I feel like the age... The age of the does, I know some people say that older doe will come in later, but I feel like my age class is pretty similar, you know, and uh, I don't really see like a lot of big old mature does. I just, but I feel like they all come in at like one time and then the woods, you know, when you go to the woods and you can just smell the rut, you know, like <laughs> when you walk to a certain area, you can just smell it. That's, right. that's when I this you know the seventh eighth ninth and then this year a cold front hits mid central illinois the the eighth yeah the morning of the eighth yep. or the evening of the seventh eighth ninth and tenth it's going to go from highs in the 50s lows in the low 50s high 40s to lows in the mid 20s to highs in the 40s so i protect this rut for us to be really good Oh, it's already been good, and uh, I just filmed my neighbor actually last week on November on October twenty fourth, October twenty fourth. So I'm already on the board for running the camera for a kill, uh, hundred and seventy three and seven eighths inch ten. Ooh. Ten point um, man, that's a stud, oh, yeah. huh? Oh, he's just stud. man. I mean, a well, actually, well, he was a six by five, so eleven point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, stud wow. of a buck. Um, but we we killed him before he started. Uh, uh, really wandering and, 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 and leaving his home core area. And we knew we are in crunch time. So right now, uh, November here is November 2nd in the Midwest. Um, I don't know if I should date this, but, um, um, you know, bucks are starting to spread out a little bit more and roam out a little bit more and uh, check out doe groups and on farms that they haven't been on all year. Um, so it's, it's starting to, you know, starting to, uh, get to where uh when you're hunting a particular buck sometimes it's not as easy especially when they start actually getting with the does um but certainly uh you know that's why i think it's important for all your listeners to really look hard at 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 getting this app and i i I don't mean to hard sell it it's just uh heck put it on your phone and it's got all this information on there and, and i'll keep updating the information on it as information comes in and uh we may even eventually do i'm not saying we will through this whitetail app uh some webinars throughout the year uh on on whitetail hunting so uh, again if you if you want to pick my brain go to www.whitetailtech or i'm sorry www.gotgametech.com and uh get you that uh whitetail tech app it's not been launched yet, but it will be out very, very, very soon. It might it'd be out real close to when we release this. Yeah. So that'd be good. But yeah, like like you said, ten bucks. Like I spend ten bucks at the gas station on Slim Jims and Diet Pepsi. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So that's nothing compared to the the amount of time and the amount of effort and the amount of work and money that you put into these whitetails. Ten bucks to have Steve Stoltz in your pocket, like, all right, Steve. Help me out, brother. What do I need to do right now? You know, just, I mean, and I, I tell homie a lot of the time is hunting for me is confidence. If I feel like I'm going into a stand and I'm going to shoot a deer, I could set two, three, four more hours, you know? And if I had Steve Stoltz saying, all right, it's prime time. This is where you need to be. And I'm in there. I'm like, all right, Steve Stoltz is the man. I feel like I'm good. And I'm going to have that confidence. And like, I got, I got deer cast. I got hunt stand. I got another wind app on my phone and then the weather channel. So what's another app where I can be like, just connect all the dots and say, okay, the weather's good on the deer cast side, but where do I need, where does Steve say I need to be this time of year? Connect (laughs) the dots there and then say, okay, so I got the right weather. Uh, Steve's saying I need to be, you know, close to bedding, doe bedding. I'm going in. I got the right wind. Here we go. You know, 
Uh, maybe and, maybe try this calling technique. Okay, I'm going to maybe try that. So I think that's just another Connect the Dots app for the new age. You know, from 10 years ago, you never heard about honey naps, but now yeah. everybody has them. So I think I think it's going to be a vital tool that I use. I'm excited to try it and get it because it's anything that makes me a better hunter for 10 bucks. I mean, get out of here. I mean, I, I spend that on bow hooks a year, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be very, very reasonable. I uh, don't know the exact price of it, um, but it'll be very reasonable and affordable and um, a lot of information. Um, yeah, and then you being able to update it, too, is super awesome. So, yes. I mean, yes. the and random I'm, updates and then web up webinars. I mean, if, if there was one of, you know, and then you, I mean, I heard something about you being able to call into the phone and then match it with how you're calling. Yes. I yeah, mean, that's so awesome. Be, yeah, so I'll have I um I'll have, I'll cover like tending grunt and the trailing grunt and the buck brow and you know doe bleeds and snort snort wheeze all that and uh, 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 fawn bleed and then we'll have uh, uh, you know I'll be doing it I'll demonstrate it I will go over uh, when what times of year you use it and why you use it and then I'll also we'll have on there either live video and audio or at least audio of the deer actually doing it in the in the wild oh, um, that's gonna be sweet you know yeah. so i mean it, it it can be it it can be a great tool if you're learning the call or if you have a question about a call like we covered a lot in this on this podcast um kind of a, a a little uh refresher in what you might need might need need to use uh on a certain time of the year um, and what my thoughts are on using that call. Um, you know, and again, I'm going to, uh, as we go, I'll do write-ups on different, uh, items. I said at the beginning of the show, uh, such, you know, your, your main key points, such as taking inventory and, and targeting bucks, planning food plots, scouting, tree stand, uh, location and placement and in-season tactics, one of the season uh, things on in-season tactics that I'm going to cover are that nobody ever talks about are isolated incidents and uh, how you hunt isolated incidents. And I think that deal where you're talking about your your greenhouses is could be an isolated incident where that buck has a doe in there, and and and, and when it happens, you need to hunt it and know how to hunt it, hunt it right. Um, uh, and then an isolated incident. It's usually, by the way, are ones that are observed where you see, you know, coming up where you, you were coming up on that time where you see a giant buck with a doe uh, and it's got her pinned in this patch of timber. Uh, it, you, you need to go hunt that. Go hunt that doe. Go go get in there and hunt that. Uh, he, she's liable to dra- drag him right back by you for the evening hunt if you see him in the morning. Don't be scared to move. Uh, you know, I'm going to cover scent control and usage. And I think so much is not talked about about scent usage and, 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 and that's not, not just cover up scents and keeping yourself scent free, but I'm talking about actual, how I'm, how I'm inventorying my bucks, how I'm putting scent buck scents in scrapes and why bucks are cross urinating over those scrapes. And I'm getting the pictures of my biggest bucks on my farm through my tactics. All these can be learned on and by getting this low cost white tail tech app. I'm stoked, man. Mm-hmm. I, I, I want to learn about scrapes a lot. That's something that we just started pretty hardcore this year using. So I'm pumped, man. I'm ready for it to come out. Yeah, I know. my hands on it and get, get in one there. And... The, a scrape is one of the very best tools known to mankind, if not the best, to, uh, to, to get MRI and, uh, and, 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 um, well, I, MRI and you know most recent information, and LRI, last year's information. Oh, I should LYI, last year's information, and put it all together for a game plan to kill a big buck. Scrapes will take you to the promised land. Yeah, that's where we got the pick of Mister Freeze is hitting a scrape. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, he's there. He's close. Like you said, he's bedding closer than we think. So. <laughs> He's either two places. He's either by the double man stand, which would make sense because he hasn't been there the previous years before, but I've been going in there, or he's in that little bedding thicket, or he's there both. He's at both places, which he possibly could be both places very easily. Gotcha. 
Awesome. All right, Steve, before we let you go, I got one question for you that Cody and I put our heads together and we're like, if we could ask Mark Dre one question, this would be it. When you get a cold front in October and then it just stays cold, when do you consider that cold front to be over? Well, uh, I guess that that I could answer that um, in two ways. It's 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 never over. It's, it stays cold. Um, but you're right. Uh, it, it you can consider a front over after about a day to day and a half. So if you're looking at window time, I'd say 36 hours. Okay. Um, any time. Okay. Take take. Remember this, listeners. Remember this. Anytime the weather levels off to a same temperature and uh, same mean temperature and same conditions for more than 36 to 48 hours, deer movement goes down. Okay. And until another front changes, a la uh, change in particular change of wind direction, that's, that's when deer movement will pick it back up. And remember this also. Everybody talks about moon phases, and I'm going to cover moon phases very heavily on Whitetail Tech and why I think moon phases affect more about where you select your stand than about predicting exactly what time a deer will show up. But <clears throat> that being said, one thing the listeners, you, you guys have to remember is when temperatures level off, Grand the, the, the deer movement gets more suppressed. And then when conditions change, it picks back up. Another front comes through. It rains while it's still cool. Um, wind changes from northerly to southerly. That movement will pick back up. Any change. And also remember, weather trumps moon. And, and again, I'll cover moon phases uh, very heavily in whitetail tech. And, uh, but, uh, and, and how I select my stand selection more on moon phases um but i but i don't select them based on the moon uh when deer are going to move to the moon phase in other words uh when in a moon same theories that the Drury's have when the moon is rising or falling you have an active moon they're going to deer are going to be more active and so that has more of a play of choosing whether to hunt in security cover or hunt in a travel corridor or staging area and or right on feed than anything else okay um but weather will trump moon phase although moon phase needs to be paid close attention to so there's a lot of lot of moving parts in trying to figure out uh just like and i'm and i don't know what's gone into the jury's deer cast app and i would strongly suggest to get that as well i'm sure it's awesome um and that probably has a lot of mark and terry's thoughts on uh when conditions are all lined up right where your better chances of getting movement in certain areas are, you know. Yeah, for sure. So I like how you said that. So like if a cold front comes in, you know, and it stays cold, if it's still, it's normal for more than 36 hours, the deer are going to already been altered to that and just go back to their normal time, you know, their normal, what they're normally doing. So yeah, that's good and to so know. Also to add to that, anytime the temp, when you do have a front come in and the temperature drops 10 to 15 degrees, below normal temp what it's been the mean temperatures that it's been and that could be even in early season if the weather has been 85 degrees and you get a temperature drop to 70 one day they're going to move they're going to move so anytime you have a 10 to 15 degree temperature drop in a in a in a front you can take to the bank the deer will be on their feet the next that after that as soon as that front moves through that's awesome. Yeah, so it don't have to get extremely cold as long as it's altered from what has normally been 10 to 15 degrees. You can expect good deer movement. So that's good absolutely. knowledge too. Yeah, a absolutely. A lot of people look at just that temp. Oh, my God, it's still going to be 70 degrees there. You know, I'm not going to get a good one shot. Well, that just isn't the case. Uh, uh, tr uh, we, we just, we've seen it too many times that now we know that, that deer – feel those temperature drops as well and uh they move to them yeah for sure well steve we've we've spent a long time with you we cannot thank you enough for the time you spent with a couple of illinois boys this is 
this has been a, a an honor to to talk to you and, and spend this time with you and to pick your brain. Um, I learned a ton. I know the listeners are going to learn a ton, and I know when the listeners download that app, they're going to learn an awful lot. So I'm super excited about that app. Uh, can't wait till it comes out. And just again, thank thank you for for spending some time with us. We're just some Podunk Illinois boys, and it's been a I mean, it's this, been awesome. Yeah, this and, has uh, been, I mean, truly incredible to talk, to be able to talk to Steve Stoltz, man. Right. It's Steve Stoltz, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> Fanboying over here a little bit. <laughs> Steve, I know we, I know we covered you kind of, uh, getting into your world championships there at the beginning. Um, but I think I'd like to have you back on here. Yeah. Uh, right before turkey season and go over some turkey calling tactics. Yeah, that'd I be mean, awesome. this is the guy to talk to. Yeah, this is the guy to talk to for turkey calling tactics. So if you oh. can if you can find some time in the spring where you're not dropping longbirds, we'd we'd love to get you back on and cover turkey talk more. Oh, that'd be awesome. Um uh, I'm I'm thinking maybe like the I don't know, your seasons start pretty early in April, so I'm thinking maybe the month of March or towards the end of March would be a good time. Yeah, that'd be that. perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we we'll, would we would greatly appreciate you. I got your number now, so I'll send you a text and see what the what the time period can be to where we get that lined up. But just a huge thank you, man, for for coming on here and uh, giving us this awesome content, and then also letting the listeners be able to learn from one of the the greats of our time. You know, so we appreciate. Well, it. I pre- I I don't know about that, but I appreciate uh, you having me and and. Um... Uh, I just hope everybody enjoys and, and uses this app and it helps people. I, I think would probably be wise to put a link on there where people can download success pictures, maybe even from deer that, 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 that helped that app helped them with. Yeah. That'd be um, awesome. Yeah. That'd yeah. be sweet. It's super be sweet. Cool. Yeah. yeah so. All right. All right, man. Thanks, guys. All right, man. Hope you guys enjoy Steve. We're going to keep the outro short. Uh, check out the app. Uh, Whitetail Tech app. Um, I know we're going to be using it hardcore. Uh, super excited to get the pre-download of that to be able to use it. Um, remember, guys, have some fun. Try to leave a legacy. And Whitetail Legacy is out. We'll come back when we got a booner down.